Hello, everybody, and welcome to what, uh, in some respects, may be the video lecture that you've been waiting for. We have been talking a lot about different tools in our core Vector GIS toolkit, and we've been getting to know them in a fair amount of detail, and I keep telling you that we're going to be able to use these tools in order to solve problems and to answer questions. And, well, here we are. Here we're going to, in this uh, first video lecture here, begin to put all of these tools together in order to solve problems and to answer questions that we might have. And the key here is going to be chaining all of these procedures or these tools in the correct order together so that we arrive at the solution that we want to, uh, uh, that we want. So I'm going to be teaching this to you in a very specific way. When I talk about GIS problem solving or answering questions in GIS, you might think that I was about to fire up a, a particular GIS software package, whichever one's your favorite at the moment, and start clicking buttons and, and start going through different menus and so forth. Well, I'm not. I'm going to teach GIS problem solving to you in a very different way using a methodology that I found has been extremely helpful to students. And this involves diagramming out your GIS procedures. So we want to be able to diagram this out, and, and this is done pencil on paper. What I want you to do is to, uh, to think on paper, so to speak. So I like to say think on paper. I think that it's a misconception that GIS is done completely on a computer. There are lots of um, things that we do in GIS that don't require us staring at the computer, sitting there clicking buttons trying to get something done. Uh, we've got to think out our procedure, we've got to think about what we want to do before we even sit down in the computer lab or open up the software. And so this idea of thinking on paper is an excellent one when you're diagramming out your procedure. So this is what I encourage you to do. This is what I encourage every student to do when they've got a problem or they've got a question that they're trying to answer in GIS. I don't even want them to open up the software. I want them to take a notebook uh, and a pencil out and you can go to a coffee shop. You can go someplace else. Don't take your laptop with you. You can keep it closed if you do. And sit there with the question that you've got and then sit down and start diagramming out exactly what you've got to do in a flowchart fashion using the technique that I'm going to be showing you right here. Uh, I have found that this helps students immensely because, well, for many reasons, but I found that, you know, a lot of students will be given a GIS problem and they'll be sitting there at the computer trying to get something, you know, trying to type something or click something and they'll be saying, uh, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Well, we really want to draw a distinction between not knowing fundamentally how to answer the question or solve the problem and then not understanding how to implement it in the software. And those are very different problems and I think students must, uh, must recognize that. So we need to, to separate the uh, methodology of problem solving from the software execution. By far, the, uh, the worst problem to have is not understanding the methodology. When I have students say, I don't understand what to do. Well, if you don't understand the methodology, which is what we're working on right here, then you're never going to be able to do the software execution because you don't know what uh, uh, functions you need to execute. But I have found that if students really focus on getting this methodology nailed down and they've got the sheet of paper next to them that has this flow chart and this diagram of exactly how to solve the problem from step one to the solution, diagrammed out in flow chart fashion, and they take this sheet of paper to the computer lab with them and they set it down beside the computer and then they follow the procedure that is on the a sheet of paper, they get to the solution. They'll get the computer, they'll get the software to do what they need it to do. And this also helps when uh, students come in and ask for me to ask me for help because I found that 
ever since I've started teaching this, it becomes increasingly rare, teaching problem solving in this way, it becomes increasingly rare that when a student comes to see me, we actually have to turn on the software. What we do is the student says, okay, I have a problem. They bring in their diagram, say, look, this is the, the point of the procedure that I'm having a problem with. Here's the point that I can't get over. You know, we pull out some uh, pencils and we work the diagram uh, at a table. And then I send it with them once we've gotten the solution worked through, gotten their problem worked out. Then they go to the computer lab and they, they get the software to, uh, to do what the methodology is. So I really want you to separate these two things in your mind as well. I know that uh, many GIS software packages can be very complex and lots of people aren't used to working with complex software packages when they first come in. And so that this software execution, getting software to do exactly what you want it to do, is, uh, is something that students uh, often focus on. But by far, the more important thing is to focus on getting the methodology right. Because we can go on Google and we can look up, oh, I really need to do X or Y, and I can't get the software to do it. Well, we can look up help files or we can look up other people who have been trying to do that online, and they can, we can figure out how to get the software to execute. But if we don't know what we need to do, then we're never going to be able to solve that problem. So when I'm talking about learning how to solve problems in GIS, I'm really here focused on this methodology. So let me show you how we're going to be diagramming out GIS problems because I want to standardize that across not only what I'm doing and showing you, but I want to standardize it across all of my students, uh, people across class. That way we can all look at each other's diagrams, understand what's going on, understand what uh, we're trying to do, uh, and that will help us out as well. So when we're diagramming a GIS procedure, this is how we want it to look, okay? I've got colors up here. I've got uh, blue, yellow, and green. And if you're just working with pencil on paper, you might not have colors, and that's fine. Although, I do recommend sometimes, I I've sat down with colored pencils, I've sat down with some markers when I'm doing a diagram uh, in a notepad, so that I have uh, the colors, that I so I keep all of that consistent and I understand what I'm trying to do. But if you don't have the colors, that's fine if you're just working with pencil. But take a look what I've got here. I've got uh, an oval here which is, has my original data in it, and then I've got this uh, square here with the, the rounded edges, and then I've got another oval over here with this output. So I want us to be sure that we work in these three steps. The data, some kind of tool process or operation that we're going to be executing on that data, and then we're going to be getting some kind of output. So whenever we're doing, uh, working on a GIS problem, we're going to have to have some kind of original data, whether this is something that's given to you or you've been able to download or it's something that you've had to create. We're going to have some type of original data and then we're going to execute some tool process or operation. And these are all of our G basic GIS uh, toolkit operations here. So you pick which one is appropriate in the particular circumstance, and then you execute it. And you know some of these tools like, have different parameters down here. So if there's some kind of parameter or option that you need to choose when you run this tool, well, we need to specify that in our diagram as well. So sometimes you'll see different specifications written in here in the tool. I want you to write down the, the, the specifications that you want for the tool when you're doing the diagram as well. For instance, if you're going to be running a buffer operation and you need a 10 mile buffer, then you would write buffer in here and then down here along the bottom you'd write 10 miles so you know the specification of the buffer. And then this one over here is extremely critical. This output data set. I want you to be extremely explicit about what you think the output of your result is going to be. The output of the, uh, the tool or process or operation is going to be. And this is, this is really a key part of using this methodology because sometimes I find that students get really caught up on the process over here and they're, they're doing some kind of diagram and they've got this box that has a process in it 
and then it goes over to another box that they're going to do another process and then they're going to go over here to another process and they're trying to chain all of these boxes together because ultimately um, what we're going to be doing here this is a one-step kind of diagram here but almost no problem is ever one step they all require multiple steps so then we're going to be taking this output data set and we're going to be putting it into another tool process or function and then getting another output out of that. So we're going to be chaining all of this together. But what happens if you're not really explicit about what your output data set is and you're trying to do something like this and just, just trying to go from process to process to process to process is that you're not really thinking about, okay, when I execute this right here, what is it that I'm expecting the computer to give me? You know, that way you know and I know exactly what you think you're going to have when you uh, execute this that particular function on that particular data set. What's it going to give you? Then, you know, we talked about um, the different acceptable inputs for different tools. You know, that some tools uh, only allow certain kinds of inputs. And so when you're very explicit about what the output of this tool is going to be, well, when you've got this tool right here that is, uh, you want to put this output into here, you'll know, well, now what are acceptable inputs for this tool? And is this output that I got here something that is acceptable? To, uh, or something that qualifies as an acceptable input to this next function? And you can see that if you're explicit about your outputs and you miss a lot of that if you're trying to just chain tool to tool to tool. So I I'm, I'm really think that this is an extremely critical component of this, being extremely explicit about what you, what you expect the computer to return. And then that way it's even easier to troubleshoot once you get into the lab and you start moving through here. You can say, okay, at this particular point in my procedure, I expected to have this very specific information. And then you can check it on the computer. And then you go, okay, now wait a minute. I either have what I, what I expect or you realize that the computer has given you something different, maybe it's because the tool that you used or the operation or the procedure didn't operate the way that you thought it would. Maybe it gave you something different and you go, okay, now wait a minute, I've got something really uh, wrong here. I've got something that's very different from what I was expecting. Is it because I used the wrong tool, the wrong process? Is it because the, the, the tool that I was using gave me a different result than I was expecting? Uh, what happened? So knowing exactly the, what this output data set is, is what you're expecting here is, is critical. So these three steps, original data in blue, tool operation output, and then what I'm going to be doing as well, once we reach our final stopping place, once we reach our solution, I'm going to be using this uh, red diamond to tell us that, hey, that's when we're going to stop or you know, and then write in what the expected solution is. So we know we've gone all the way from blue, the original data, through all of our chain down to what we believe the solution should be. Okay, well, that's sort of the theory about what we're going to be doing here and the way that I'm going to be teaching this to you. So we will take a look at our first very simple problem, but our first problem in the next video.